Yeah, then. Um, so hi everyone, nice to see you again. I'm Rachel, I'm a junior doctor working in South London and this evening I'll be taking you through SBAs in lung cancer. So if you just bear with me a second, I'm going to share my screen with you. Um, maximize that. So hopefully you can all see that on the, um, on the screen now. So why are we talking about lung cancer? Well, there are over 47,000 new lung cancer diagnoses made each year in the UK, which makes it the second most common type of cancer for men and women. And it's also the second most common cause of cancer deaths in the UK. And unfortunately, it still has a very poor prognosis. So 10 year survival following diagnosis is less than 10%. But despite that poor prognosis, over 80% of lung cancer cases are preventable. So thinking about those risk factors for developing lung cancer, smoking is by far the biggest risk factor. It's responsible for around 72% of lung cancer cases in the UK. And as you can see from the graph, the risk is dose dependent. So the more cigarettes a person smokes and the longer they smoke for, the greater their risk of developing lung cancer. Passive smoking is also an established risk factor for lung cancer, although there's some mixed evidence on the setting and the duration of exposure that's needed to increase the risk. But there are also multiple occupational exposures that can increase the risk of lung cancer. So asbestos is probably the best known of these. That's a fibrous building material, which is now illegal in the UK, but previously was widely used in construction. And although it's more strongly associated with mesothelioma, it does also increase the risk of adenocarcinoma of the lung. And there's also a genetic component to the risk of developing lung cancer. So the risk is around 82% higher in patients who have a sibling who've, who's had lung cancer and about 37% higher in patients whose parent has had the disease. So thinking about the pathophysiology of lung cancer, it occurs when there's uncontrolled division of epithelial cells that lie in the respiratory tract. So essentially exposure to carcinogens like cigarette smoke over time leads to multiple mutations within the DNA of normal epithelial cells. And that affects those tumor suppressor and oncogenes. The mutations in these genes mean that the normal cellular processes which regulate cell division no longer occur. So there's unregulated cell division that leads to rapidly dividing mutated cells that form the tumor. Now lung cancers can be divided into two main categories based on the size of the malignant cells on microscopy. Small cell carcinomas account for around 15% of lung cancer diagnoses and non-small cell carcinomas can be further divided into adenocarcinomas, which account for around 40% of the total. So they're the most common type of lung cancer. Squamous cell carcinomas, which account for around 30% of the total. And large cell carcinomas, which account for around 10% of the total. And there are also some rarer causes like carcinoid tumors. Of course, tumors in the lung can also be metastases from other primary tumor sites. And common malignancies which can metastasize to the lung include breast, colorectal, and renal carcinomas. And in this presentation, we'll also touch on mesothelioma, which is a tumor of the mesothelial cells typically occurring in the pleura. So let's kick off with our first SBA of the lecture. We'll give you a minute to read through and then there'll be a poll that appears on the screen so you can select which you think is the right answer. Ooh. Sorry. <laughs> 
10 more seconds. Okay, so around 70% of people have gone for option D and 30% for A with very small numbers going for the other options. And you are overwhelmingly correct. So D is the right answer here. And that's because this patient has a red flag feature in their history. So according to NICE guidelines, any patient over the age of 40 who presents with unexplained hemoptysis should be referred urgently to the respiratory clinic under a two week wait referral. And the key features that you've hopefully picked up on in this case that should be increasing your suspicion of lung cancer are the unexplained weight loss and the hemoptysis in this patient with a significant smoking history. To run through the other options, an urgent chest x-ray um, would be an appropriate initial investigation in many circumstances, um, including patients over the age of 40 presenting with symptoms like persistent chest infections, cough, shortness of breath, fatigue, weight loss, um, but in this case, because the patient is presenting with that red flag feature of unexplained hemoptysis, that needs investigation with a CT scan. And so referring a patient for a chest x-ray will just delay that process, because regardless of the outcome of the chest x-ray, a CT scan will be necessary. Um, similarly, prescribing a course of antibiotics first is just going to delay the patient's access to a CT scan, and routine referral is going to be too slow in a patient with these red flag features. And then immediate referral to the emergency department would be appropriate if the patient has concerning clinical features like stridor on examination or evidence of hemodynamic instability. So perhaps if there's signs of sepsis or some of the complications of lung cancer um, like superior vena cava obstruction, which we'll talk about later in the presentation. So just to summarize, common sort of symptoms that can present in patients with an underlying lung cancer are a persistent cough, increasing shortness of breath, that unexplained hemoptysis, which is the real red flag feature. Some patients might develop a hoarse voice if the recurrent laryngeal nerve is being compressed or compromised by the tumor. Um, patients can also present with chest pain, symptoms of weight loss, anorexia, fatigue, other constitutional symptoms. And of course, some patients may present with symptoms or signs of the complications of lung cancer. So things like paraneoplastic syndromes, SVC obstruction or metastatic disease, all of which we'll touch on later. Thinking about your examination findings. So um, on examination, you might notice that a patient is particularly cachectic if they're suffering from anorexia. Then clubbing is associated with lung cancer. And there's a picture of clubbing on the screen for you there. You should also examine the patient for supraclavicular and auxiliary lymphadenopathy. And on auscultation of the lungs, you may hear stridor, wheeze. There could be evidence of a pleural effusion, so dullness to percussion and reduced air entry or breath sounds on auscultation, or even evidence of a lung collapse. And here's a summary of those nice guidelines that I mentioned earlier. So if you are sitting in your GP surgery room and a patient presents to you with those features of stridor or symptoms of superior vena cava obstruction, you'll be directing them straight to A&E. Um, if they've got unexplained hemoptysis and they're over the age of 40, or there's a suspicious lesion on their chest x-ray, or you've got a really strong clinical suspicion that they could have lung cancer, then you're going to refer them under a two-week wait referral to secondary care. Um, but otherwise, and this will probably catch lots of patients, an urgent chest x-ray is often the first step. Um, and just to point out to you that patients over the age of 40 with two of those symptoms should receive an urgent chest x-ray, but actually if they're an ex or a current smoker, they only need one of those symptoms. So you can imagine that there would be quite a lot of um, you know, patients who are smokers presenting with symptoms like cough and shortness of breath. So thinking about those investigations in a bit more detail. So we've said that chest x-rays are often a first line investigation done in patients with suspected lung cancer. And it's really important to note that a normal chest x-ray does not exclude a cancer diagnosis. In about 10% of patients who are subsequently diagnosed with lung cancer, the first chest x-ray was normal. Um, and that's why, you know, that feature of high clinical suspicion for lung cancer is really important to be aware of in terms of referring on to secondary care. 
But if there is an abnormality on the chest X-ray, findings you might see would include a peripheral circular opacity. You might see higher enlargement. So on this chest X-ray on this screen, you can see that area of increased opacity in the left hyla region that's being handily pointed out by that red arrow. Um, other features might be consolidation, pleural effusion, even evidence of bony secondaries on the chest X-ray. But your CT scan is really the investigation of choice for suspected lung cancer, and it's used to stage the tumour. The CT usually also includes the liver and the adrenal glands to check for metastases. Other investigations include bronchoscopy, which enables biopsies to be taken to obtain a histological diagnosis. And sometimes that's aided by endobronchial ultrasound or CT. You could also have an endobronchial ultrasound guided needle aspiration, and that tends to be used if there's high suspicion of a mediastinal malignancy on CT scanning. PET scans are often used in non-small cell lung cancer to help to establish eligibility for curative treatment. So in PET scans, the dye is preferentially taken up by neoplastic tissue, which then lights up on the scan, and that helps to improve the diagnostic sensitivity of local and distant metastases. And just thinking about other things you might find in the course of your investigation. So on blood tests, patients with lung cancer may have a thrombocytosis. You may see evidence of deranged LFTs if they've developed hepatic metastases. A raised ALP might make you think about bony metastases and electrolyte abnormalities like hyponatremia or hypercalcemia can also be seen as part of these um, paraneoplastic syndromes. And just to mention sputum cytology is not very commonly used now and it's mostly used for patients who have centrally placed masses but can't tolerate things like bronchoscopy or other invasive tests. Okay, moving on to the next question. One more second. Okay, so about 56% of people have gone for small cell lung cancer, um, and then there's a bit of a spread between B and C. So the correct answer here is small cell lung cancer. Now, this is a presentation of Lambert-Eaton myasthenic syndrome, and that's a paraneoplastic disorder which is associated with small cell lung cancer. We'll discuss it again in a moment, but briefly, patients typically present with symptoms of limb weakness that predominantly affects the lower limbs, and they also report autonomic symptoms like the dry mouth mentioned in this case. And uh, Lambert-Eaton myasthenic syndrome is not associated with any of the other types of cancer, which is why they're not the right answer. So small cell carcinoma is a cancer of the Kolchitsky cells, which are part of the neuroendocrine APUD system. And they produce polypeptides and amines, which act as hormones and neurotransmitters, which is why small cell carcinoma is associated with several different paraneoplastic syndromes. Small cell carcinomas account for about 15% of lung cancers. They most often affect older smokers and they tend to be located within the central airways. So they infiltrate the submucosa and cause narrowing of those bronchial airways. Small cell carcinomas grow very rapidly and they're highly malignant. 
They spread early, so often at the time of presentation, they're already inoperable with a poor prognosis. Small cell lung cancer can be staged according to the TNM system, which we'll discuss later in the presentation, but often a simpler two-stage system is used, which kind of better reflects the limited opportunities for curative treatment in small cell carcinoma. So briefly, management options include surgical resection for very early stage tumours, a combination of chemo and radiotherapy in limited disease, or palliative chemotherapy in extensive disease. So as we discussed in that case study, Lambert-Eaton myasthenic syndrome is a paraneoplastic disorder associated with small cell lung cancer and it causes circulating antibodies against the voltage-gated calcium channels in the peripheral nervous system. This inhibits acetylcholine release into the synaptic cleft and therefore inhibits neuromuscular transmission. So it typically presents with proximal limb weakness that predominantly affects the lower limbs. And the weakness typically improves with increased muscle contraction, but then worsens if that exercise is sustained. And patients also report autonomic symptoms like dry mouth or impotence um, and myalgia muscle pains. On examination, you'd expect to find proximal muscle weakness with reduced or absent reflexes. And diagnosis is made through nerve conduction studies. The management of this condition involves counseling patients on smoking cessation if appropriate, and it's mainly about treating the underlying cancer. So effective treatment of the underlying tumour often significantly improves the patient's strength. There are medical therapies available to help to improve the muscle strength and also uh, immunosuppressants and immunoglobulins for severe cases. Okay, on to question three. Ten more seconds. Okay, so uh, almost 70% have gone for B and smaller numbers between A, C and D predominantly. So this is a presentation of Cushing syndrome, secondary to ectopic ACTH production. So you guys are right to pick B. And again, this is associated with small cell lung cancer. The ectopic ACTH production from the tumor stimulates the adrenal glands to produce this excess cortisol. And that leads to patients presenting with symptoms like proximal muscle weakness, central obesity, hypertension, hypokalemia, and diabetes mellitus or poorly controlled blood sugars, as we've seen in this case. The mention of the lack of cortisol suppression with the dexamethasone test indicates that this is an ectopic source of ACTH. So if it was a pituitary tumor that was producing the ACTH, Cushing's disease, then there would be cortisol suppression with the high dose dexamethasone. Just to briefly run through your, the other options, so ectopic CRH and ADH production can also be seen with small cell lung cancers, but Cushing syndrome caused by ectopic CRH production rather than ACTH production is extremely rare. 
and the question is asking for the hormone most likely to be causing the patient's symptoms. Um, if there was ectopic CRH production, then the patient would present with the same symptoms of Cushing syndrome, but serum CRH levels would be inappropriately elevated. So remember in normal physiology, you'd expect CRH to be suppressed in the presence of high cortisol levels. Ectopic ADH production would cause symptoms like fluid retention and dilutional hyponatremia, resulting in the syndrome of inappropriate ADH secretion, SIADH. Ectopic parathyroid hormone related protein production is associated with squamous cell lung cancers, um, but it causes hypercalcemia. And ectopic GHRH production is seen relatively rarely with bronchial carcinoid tumors, um, and that causes acromegaly. So we've already mentioned that small cell carcinoma is a cancer of those neuroendocrine cells that produce hormones and neurotransmitters and therefore causes a number of different paraneoplastic syndromes. So in paraneoplastic Cushing syndrome, that ectopic ACTH is being produced by the tumor, stimulates the adrenal glands and increases the production of cortisol. And that results in all those symptoms that we've already described and you can see on the screen there. And just to point out those classical features of a buffalo hump and a moon face that you might think of with Cushing's disease don't tend to be present in Cushing's syndrome. Your diagnosis is made with the finding of raised 24 hour urinary free cortisol levels um, and in the absence of cortical suppression on the dexamethasone suppression test. You'd also want to arrange a CT chest and abdomen for the patient to identify the underlying tumor if it's not already known. And treatment essentially involves managing and treating the underlying tumor and correcting any electrolyte abnormalities. So another paraneoplastic disorder associated with small cell carcinomas is SIADH. And as we mentioned, ectopic ADH is being produced by the tumor, which results in fluid retention and subsequently dilutional hyponatremia in the serum. And that fluid retention also results in reduced aldosterone secretion and that in turn increases the excretion of sodium and water in the urine, which further exacerbates the overall hyponatremia. So patients with SIADH would present with symptoms like headaches, nausea and vomiting, muscle cramps and cerebral edema. So that could present with confusion, hallucinations in more severe cases with seizures and coma. To diagnose it, you'd expect to see low serum sodium and serum osmolarity and raised urinary sodium and urinary osmolality. And your management involves treating the underlying cancer, again, um, fluid restricting the patient, treating them with a high salt and high protein diet. In chronic cases, medical options include demeclocycline, um, and in acute severe hyponatremia, you would give careful IV hypertonic fluids. Okay, moving on to question four. Ten more seconds. <clears throat> okay, so about 60% of people have gone for adenocarcinoma and around 20% for mesothelioma and squamous cell. So you guys are on a roll because you've got it right again. It's adenocarcinoma is the most likely diagnosis here. And that's because adenocarcinoma is the most common type of lung cancer that's seen in non-smokers and in women. 
Um, and it's a cancer that arises from the mucus cells in the bronchial epithelium that's typically found in the peripheral airways. So that's in keeping with that chest x-ray finding of a peripheral opacity. To run through your other options, uh, small cell lung cancers, as we've just been talking about, typically affect smokers and tend to be located centrally. Squamous cell lung cancers more commonly affect smokers as well. Um, they typically present as an obstructive lesion in a bronchus that causes infection. Large cell carcinomas are a less common type of non-small cell carcinoma. They account for about 5 to 10% of all lung cancers. Um, again, they're more common in smokers, although they can be seen both centrally and peripherally. And mesothelioma is a cancer of the pleural cavity, strongly associated with asbestos exposure. So your classic chest x-ray findings for that diagnosis would be a pleural effusion or pleural thickening. <clears throat> so that brings us on to talk about adenocarcinomas, which are the most common type of lung cancer in the UK. Um, as I've already said, it arises from mucus cells in the bronchial epithelium, typically found in the peripheral airways, so the smaller airways like the alveoli. And lung adenocarcinoma tends to grow more slowly than some of the other lung cancers. It commonly invades the mediastinal lymph nodes in the pleura, and it can cause pleural effusions. So the universal TNM staging system is used to give a summary of the disease burden. The T component, as you're probably familiar with, represents the primary tumour, and it considers factors like the size of the tumour, as well as the relationship of the tumour with the airway, whether it's invaded into surrounding structures, um, and the presence of solitary or multiple nodules within the lung. The N component represents the involvement of the lymph nodes, and the M component is for metastases, whether metastases are present or absent. Fab, we'll move on to question five. Ten more seconds. Okay, so about fifty percent have gone for C, thirty percent for A, and then um, various amounts split between the other options. So this question is asking you about the management of hypercalcemia, which is a common electrolyte abnormality seen in patients with an underlying malignancy. And you might remember that um, common mnemonic that's associated with hypercalcemia, symptoms of stones, bones, groans, thrones, and psychiatric overtones. So your initial management is with intravenous fluid replacement. And that's because patients with hypercalcemia are typically very dehydrated and replacing that fluid increases the urinary excretion of calcium. To run through your other options, so IV bisphosphonate should be prescribed, but after the patient has been rehydrated with intravenous fluids and the bisphosphonates help to reduce bone turnover and therefore reduce serum calcium levels. Your intravenous loop diuretics like furosemide can be used in hypercalcemia after the patient has been rehydrated, again, to stimulate increased urinary secretion of calcium. But in patients who aren't fluid overloaded, it risks causing further dehydration. So it wouldn't be your first line option. The oral laxatives might help the patient's symptom of constipation, but they're not addressing the underlying hypercalcemia. 
and hemodynamics sorry, hemodialysis would be considered for patients with advanced kidney disease and refractory severe hypercalcemia. So squamous cell carcinomas usually present as this obstructive lesion of the bronchus causing infection. They're quite large tumors that can undergo central necrosis and cause cavitation. So they're the type of lung cancer that's most likely to cavitate. And this can make it more difficult to differentiate between cancer and an abscess on an X-ray. But on CT, you get an obvious jagged border that indicates that it's a cancerous lesion. It commonly spreads locally, but metastases typically occur later in the disease. Um, and it's associated with various complications, including hypercalcemia because of the release of parathyroid hormone related peptide. Um, fab. So thinking about hypercalcemia, so just to remind you of the normal physiology, normally low serum calcium triggers parathyroid hormone release, which increases bone resorption. It increases calcium reabsorption in the renal system. And through calcitrol, which is active vitamin D, it also increases intestinal calcium absorption. And these three mechanisms then help to restore normal serum, serum calcium levels and inhibit inhibit further production of parathyroid hormone. So hypercalcemia can occur in lung cancers through a few mechanisms. They can occur through bony metastases, which are osteolytic. They can occur through um, production of parathyroid hormone related protein by the tumor. So that's a polypeptide with a similar structure to parathyroid hormone, as the name would suggest which stimulates osteoclasts to break down bone and to release calcium, um, causing lytic bone lesions. And the other mechanism is by tumor secretion of calcitrol, that activated vitamin D, which then increases intestinal calcium absorption. So symptoms of hypercalcemia, you've got your stones, your renal calculi, your bones, your bony pain, groans, which can be abdominal pain, nausea, vomiting, muscle weakness. Thrones alludes to polyuria and constipation and psychiatric overtones, symptoms of confusion, depression, anxiety. Hypercalcemia is seen most commonly with squamous cell carcinoma, but it is also associated with adenocarcinoma and small cell carcinoma. And the diagnosis is made with the finding of raised serum calcium on your bone profile blood tests. And if you identify hypercalcemia in a patient, you should request an ECG um, because severe hypercalcemia can cause cardiac arrhythmias due to the shortened QT interval. So as well as stopping any hypercalcemia inducing agents that the patient might be taking, your initial management is fluid replacement um, because these patients tend to be dehydrated. And after fluid replacement, uh, we talked about giving bisphosphonates to inhibit bone turnover. Um, and of course, treating the underlying malignancy is also important. Okay, motoring on to question six. Ten more seconds. So vast majority of people have gone for um, B here, which is the correct answer. 
So <clears throat> this is a presentation of another paraneoplastic syndrome called hypertrophic pulmonary osteoarthropathy. And the three classic features of HPOA, which are periostitis, clubbing, and painful arthropathy of the large joints are all present in the history. The patient's smoking history alongside the features of unintended weight loss and the suspicious chest x-ray findings should be making you think about an underlying lung malignancy here. So just to briefly run through the other options, your medial tibial stress syndrome might be more commonly known as shin splints. That causes localized pain that occurs during exercise um, at the medial surface of the shins, essentially. It can also cause periosteal changes around the cortex on x-ray, um, but it wouldn't account for the patient's arthropathy that affects multiple large joints or the digital clubbing. Your thyroid acropatchy is a rare presentation of autoimmune thyroid disease. Um, similarly to HPOA, it presents with digital clubbing, soft tissue swelling, and a periosteal reaction of the extremities. But it's almost always associated with thyroid ophthalmopathy as well. So proptosis, lid retraction, and diplopia. And it also wouldn't explain the chest x-ray findings. Your reactive arthritis, that typically develops acutely two to four weeks after a gastrointestinal or a genitourinary infection um, with symptoms of fever, fatigue, malaise. It tends to be an asymmetrical, mainly lower limb oligoarthritis. Um, and there might be associated symptoms like urethritis, conjunctivitis, arthritis. And your septic arthritis classically presents as a single swollen warm joint. Um, which is painful on movement and associated with fever. So hypertrophic pulmonary osteoarthropathy is a syndrome that's characterized by this triad of symptoms. So periostitis, which is inflammation of the periosteum, the layer of connective tissue that surrounds bone, digital clubbing, and painful arthropathy of the large joints, especially involving the lower limbs. It's got a number of potential causes, but in the context of an underlying malignancy, it's considered to be a paraneoplastic syndrome, and it's associated with squamous cell and adenocarcinomas of the lung. So on x-ray, you would expect to see periosteal thickening. Bone scans are shown on the screen, which show parallel lines of activity along the cortex of the shafts um, and the ends of bones like the tibia, the femur and the radius. So especially around the knees, the ankles and the wrists. NSAIDs can be used to help to treat the pain and essentially treatment of the underlying cancer usually improves symptoms. And so large cell carcinoma is the last non-small cell carcinoma that we haven't talked about yet. So these are less common. They can be located both peripherally and centrally, and they're usually quite poorly differentiated tumors that carry a poor prognosis because they metastasize early. And they can also secrete the hormone beta HCG. So to summarize the treatment of these non-small cell carcinomas, of course, smoking cessation is an important intervention for any patients who are still smoking. In stage one or two disease, surgical management may be an option with lobectomy. Chemotherapy can be used in a number of ways. So it can be used as a neoadjuvant prior to surgery, an adjuvant following surgery, or for patients with extensive disease where surgery isn't actually appropriate anymore. And radiotherapy is often used as a palliative treatment to help to improve symptoms and to prolong survival. Targeted therapies can be used for patients with tumours that have specific molecular characteristics. Um, and of course, symptom management is also important. Unfortunately, as I mentioned at the beginning of the presentation, survival rates for lung cancer remain very low with little improvement over the last 40 years. So compared to other common cancers like breast or prostate cancer, where five years survival after diagnosis is over 85%, survival for lung cancer is just 15% five years after diagnosis. The survival rates are higher for patients with non-small cell lung cancers compared to small cell. And you can see from the table that survival for lung cancer is strongly related to the stage of disease at diagnosis. So the earlier it's diagnosed, the greater the chance of survival. Okay, moving on to question seven. <clears throat> 
10 more seconds. Okay, so 65% of people have gone for E, 20% um, for C, and smaller amounts uh, for other, other options. And so this is, quest is a question asking you about the management of superior vena cava obstruction. So this occurs when the superior vena cava, which just to remind you, drains blood from the head, neck, and arms into the right atrium when that blood vessel is obstructed. And the obstruction is most commonly due to external pressure from a nearby tumour. So in this case, the known background of lung carcinoma alongside the classic symptoms of dyspnea, facial swelling, headache, all exacerbated by postural changes, confirms that diagnosis of superior vena cava obstruction. And it's further confirmed by the positive Pemberton sign. So sitting the patient upright and providing some oxygen would help with providing some symptomatic relief. But your first choice option for pharmacotherapy is oral dexamethasone. And that's administered to help to reduce the swelling and therefore reduce the pressure on the superior vena cava. Um, just to run through the other options, so features such as the headache, facial edema and positive Pemberton sign are not classically seen in any of the diagnoses associated with the other options. Um, so nebulized salbutamol would be appropriate if this was a COPD exacerbation, but then you'd expect a history of sort of increased cough with increased sputum, purulence and volume. Dotaparin would be appropriate if this is a pulmonary embolism, and pulmonary embolism is a diagnosis that you should be thinking about in a patient with dyspnea and no an active um, lung cancer. But the features of headache, facial edema, positive Pemberton sign are not seen in, in pulmonary embolism. The intramuscular adrenaline you'd give in anaphylaxis, but then you'd expect an acute history of rapidly progressing dyspnea, strider, airway swelling, urticaria, etc. And your IV antibiotics would be appropriate if this was a simple case of pneumonia. So superior vena cava obstruction occurs when that superior vena cava is obstructed. That could be obstruction within the blood vessel itself because of a blood clot or because of external compression, which, as I said, is most commonly because of a nearby tumour. The external compression could be caused by mass effect. So inflammation and swelling from the tumour that's pushing up against the superior vena cava or direct tumour invasion into the SVC itself. You get these classic symptoms of dyspnea, edema of the face. So hopefully you can appreciate that in the picture of this gentleman and um, the facial edema in the left photo compared to the right. Um, as well as edema in the neck and the arms, a flushed appearance of the face and distended neck veins. So we mentioned a positive Pemberton sign in the case history as being indicative of superior vena, ca vena cava obstruction. And so a positive Pemberton sign means that when the patient raises their arms above their head as high as they can go, this causes facial flushing, distension of the neck veins and signs of respiratory distress like dyspnea or inspiratory strider, usually after around one minute. Your diagnosis is made through chest x-ray or CT scan and management involves, as I said, sitting the patient upright because the gravity helps to drain the blood from the head to the heart. Oxygen gives some symptomatic relief. The dexamethasone steroids are used to reduce the swelling and inflammation around the tumour and chemo and radiotherapy are typically used to treat the underlying tumour itself. Stenting is also sometimes used to help to relieve the obstruction. Okay, question eight. 
10 more seconds. Okay, so the majority have gone for C and other options are pretty evenly distributed. So hopefully you've recognized that this is a presentation of Horner's syndrome caused by a pancose tumor in the apex of the lung. And so when a pancose tumor infiltrates the cervical sympathetic plexus, um, this causes Horner's syndrome. You get ipsilateral meiosis, constriction of the pupil, ptosis, drooping of the upper eyelid, and enophthalmos, which is posterior displacement of the eye within its orbit, which is all seen in this case. It also causes a unilateral anhydrosis, which is loss of sweating on one side of the face, but that's a symptom that can be less noticeable to patients and to doctors on examination. And of course, the patient's smoking history, symptoms of a new cough and unintended weight loss, plus the respiratory examination findings should be making you think about an underlying lung cancer. The other options here can all be compressed by a pancose tumour as well, but they wouldn't cause those features of Horner's syndrome. So compression of the recurrent laryngeal nerve would give you a hoarse voice and a bovine cough. Compression of the brachial plexus which would cause um, its lateral shoulder pain that radiates down the arm into the hand. It might also cause atrophy of the intrinsic hand muscles and paresthesia that affects the medial arm. Compression of the phrenic nerve may not cause any symptoms at all, um, but patients might report uh, dyspnea or orthopnea, and you may see a raised hemidiaphragm on imaging. And compression of the vagus nerve would cause loss of the gag reflex, uvular deviation away from the affected side, and also a hoarse voice because the recurrent laryngeal nerve originates from the vagus nerve. So Panko syndrome is usually caused by an apical lung tumor, they're quite rare, counting for less than 5% of all lung cancers. Around half are squamous cell carcinomas and around half are adenocarcinomas. <clears throat> and the presentation depends on which structures are being compressed or invaded, um, as we've just run through the brachial plexus, the cervical sympathetic plexus. If a subclavian vein is affected, this could cause um, edema of the upper limb. And uh, you can also get superior vena cava obstruction as a result of a pancose tumor. So hopefully you can appreciate that um, increased opacity at the apex of the right lung, which is handily labeled with a P on the X-ray there, uh, showing you a pancose tumor on chest X-ray. And looking at the photo of the woman, hopefully you can appreciate the meiosis, ptosis, um, and possibly you can appreciate some posterior displacement um, of the left eye in the, in the orbit compared to the right. So lung cancers can metastasize outside of the lung, of course. Brain metastases uh, can present with signs of raised intracranial pressure, so symptoms like headaches, nausea and vomiting, and focal neurology, and they're typically identified on contrast-enhanced CT or MRI scans. Common sites for bony metastases include the spine, the pelvis, and the ribs, and patients can present with bony pain, with pathological fractures, with hypercalcemia, or a raised ALP on their LFTs. And um, these bony metastases are usually identified with PET scans, bone scans, or sometimes x-rays. Um, liver metastases are also common. Um, you would expect to see abnormal LFTs, maybe find evidence of hepatomegaly on examination. Um, and ultrasound or MRI scans are often used to identify these metastatic lesions on the liver. Um, adrenal gland metastases are also common, but they're normally asymptomatic. And of course, tumours found in the lung can also be metastases from another primary tumour tumor site. So cancers which commonly metastasize to the lung include breast, colorectal, renal cell, bladder and prostate. And these metastases often develop in the parenchyma of the lung, so they can be asymptomatic for some time. <clears throat> 
these multiple round, well-defined um, lesions that you can see demonstrated on the chest x-ray here uh, are known as cannonball metastases. They're most commonly seen with renal cell carcinoma, um, but they can also occur secondary to choriocarcinoma and prostate cancers as well. Great, last question for you. Ten more seconds. Okay, so just over 70% have gone for asbestos exposure and 20% for smoking history. So hopefully the symptoms of chest pain, shortness of breath, unintended weight loss, plus the chest x-ray findings of pleural effusion and pleural thickening are making you think of the likely diagnosis of mesothelioma here. And the patient's occupational history as a builder is another clue that he might have been exposed to asbestos, which is the correct answer for this question. So asbestos exposure accounts for around 97% of mesothelioma cases in men and about 83% of cases in women in the UK. So it's overwhelmingly the most strongly associated risk factor for the diagnosis. Just to run through the other options, there's actually relatively little evidence to suggest that smoking is an independent risk factor for the development of mesothelioma. But interestingly, smoking is a risk factor for mesothelioma if the patient has also been exposed to asbestos. And that's because smoking causes structural changes to the lungs. So it impairs the function of cilia and increases mucus production, all of which can trap uh, sorry, asbestos fibers in the lung. Um, air pollution is a risk factor for the development of bronchial carcinomas, but not in the development of mesothelioma. Obesity is not a recognized risk factor. And alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency is associated with an increased risk of developing COPD, which the patient in this case study has already been diagnosed with. But the new acute onset of cough, chest pain, unintentional weight loss, plus the findings of pleural effusion and thickening on the chest x-ray wouldn't be explained by a COPD diagnosis. So mesothelioma, this is an aggressive cancer affecting the mesothelial layer of the pleural cavity. And as we've said, it's commonly associated with asbestos exposure. Um, the asbestos fibers can affect any of the epithelial cells of any mesothelial layer in the body, but the lungs are the most commonly affected site. And the presence of these asbestos fibers in the visceral or parietal pleura leads to inflammation and DNA damage and eventually mutations arise in the DNA of these cells, leading to the cancerous tumours. Symptoms include chest pain, shortness of breath, pleural effusions and hemoptysis. In terms of your diagnosis, so on chest x-ray you may see pleural thickening and pleural effusion as we did in this case study, and there's um, the chest x-ray on the screen has a, a circle around the area of pleural thickening. A CT scan is more sensitive than a chest x-ray, although it can sometimes still be difficult to differentiate between benign and malignant pleural processes with a CT alone. Pleural fluid cytology can be obtained with a transthoracic needle aspiration, and that can help to give pathological confirmation of malignancy. But a video-assisted thoracoscopic surgery or a VATS procedure is considered to be the best study to evaluate the pleural lining of the lung and to obtain the best biopsy specimens for histology.
In terms of the management of mesothelioma, so surgery can be offered in very localised cases or for symptomatic relief. In patients with inoperable or recurrent mesotheliomas, chemotherapy is often given to try to improve the quality of life and the survival. Radiotherapy can be used to palliate local sites of disease that, quite, that might cause distressing symptoms, so most commonly pain because of chest wall invasion. Um, and symptom management can include procedures like thoracentesis for patients that are suffering from dyspnea because of large pleural effusions. So that's a procedure where they essentially insert a needle into the pleural space to drain that pleural fluid. Patients with mesothelioma may also be eligible for industrial injuries disablement benefits because of their asbestos exposure. So patients might need support and counselling to access those benefits. And the most common site of metastases um, for mesotheliomas are to the contralateral lung or to the peritoneum. So that brings us to the end of um, this evening's talk. I hope it was useful. And I've got a bit of a summary slide there just to summarise the main features associated with uh, each of the different types of lung cancer. And if you've got any questions, do feel free to pop them in the Q&A box or the chat box. And I'll just start to have a look at those. Thank you, Rachel. That was a really clear and concise overview of lung cancer. Um, we have one question in the Q&A. Um, if you're able to see it, if not, I'll, I can read it out for you. Um, I think I've just got that. So, when is it best to investigate with a CT scan instead of a PET scan? Is CT more common because it's quicker and cheaper? Um, so your CT scan is what will give you the diagnosis.